Thank you. Uh, hello, can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great. Good, good afternoon uh, and good evening to you, uh, Jay McGovern, uh, who uh, will happily introduce himself. Um, is joining us from the US in Palo Alto. Uh, my name is Dushan Stojkovic. Um, I head up the Firebridge project uh, on the VicTrack end. And this has been a true collaborative uh, project between several government departments and agencies, as well as our research partners at uh, the Palo Alto Research Center, um, PARC. So uh, with that, um, I guess a little bit about myself. Um, I've got a background in engineering. I've worked in virtual engineering uh, in the automotive industry. I've also then uh, progressed to undertake uh, various consulting and technical advisory roles um, in the mining and power industry, focusing on uh, large materials handling, machinery and equipment. And during that process have undertaken various engineering assessments, asset inspections and so on. And upon joining VicTrack uh, two and a half years ago, I saw the uh, early stages of a research project in a space that was quite close to my expertise and close to my heart, uh, as I saw a huge amount of potential in this space um, and therefore um, have been part of the project ever since. Um, in terms of introductions, I'd probably pass over to RJ to uh, introduce uh, himself uh, and then we can uh, fire up the presentation, which I hope is uh, ready and prepped on, on your end, John. Thank you, Dushan. Uh, so as Dushan introduced, uh, I am a research director at the Palo Alto Research Center here in Palo Alto, California. Uh, I've been at PARC for about 10 years now, and I've led a number of initiatives in uh, condition monitoring and health management of a number of critical assets and systems. And over the last three years, as Dushan mentioned, we've been very excited to engage uh, with, uh, with VicTrack and other Victorian state agencies uh, on a two-stage pilot uh, monitoring bridges and other critical infrastructure, as we'll discuss in our presentation here. Excellent. Um, and John, just a quick one uh, of a technical nature. Am I able to share a presentation on my end? Yes, if you share your screen, you should be able to make that work. Sure. Just a... QUT support, could you help us at all with that process? Yep, just a moment. Uh, Dushan, worst case, I can be sh uh, shared from my screen if you're having If trouble. you can, I'm having troubles, I'm sorry. If you don't mind, please, can you load it up on your end? Sure. You able to see my screen? That's great. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Great, so Dushan, do you want to get started? I can please let me know when to switch slides. I can do that here. Sure, so um, as all, technical projects go, we have a, a, a very short introductory title. <laughs> uh, so Firebridge is actually a, a bit of a concoction of, of two words, fiber and bridge. Uh, we started off with, with a much larger project title that was quite descriptive. Um, but in essence, we're looking at embedded fiber optic sensing for low cost, high resolution monitoring of bridges and IoT connected systems. Uh, and we'll hopefully convey successfully that means and what um, we've done in the process. Next slide, please. The background driver for an organization like VicTrack, and perhaps a couple of words about VicTrack for those uh, interstate or who may not be aware. VicTrack is an organization, uh, in other words, a Victorian based government agency. We, on behalf of the state of Victoria, own the entire asset base 
for um, rail operations. So we own the actual uh, titled land, uh, we own the infrastructure, the rolling stock, and own and operate the telecommunications network. As part of the broad infrastructure base that we have on, um, on our books, uh, we effectively have a huge amount of bridges. We lease out the majority of those bridges to operators. However, VicTrack directly manages a subset of that asset base. So in essence, we're an asset owner and operator. We own and do not operate a lot of our assets. What that means is that we ultimately uh, have them on our books, on our risk registers, and do share a degree of risk of ownership and operating of those assets. Now, when it comes to asset management practices, I guess within this community, it's probably nothing too unfamiliar. Um, the process of inspect, uh, inspecting assets, in other words, ascertaining the actual condition of the um, asset base is through visual inspections. Uh, they're done in a prescribed structured manner where we undertake a visual is, is inherently uh, risky. It involves a lot of human, in, human interaction with assets. Uh, there is obviously the, the potential for inspectors to not see certain critical defects and faults. Um, and again, speaking to the perhaps converted, given the, the nature of this, um, this session, uh, the need to understand through real-time information or uh, various uh, sensing technologies, the true condition of our asset base and therefore not just the risk profile of ownership of these um, assets, but also a more informed way to manage the day-to-day uh, -day maintenance uh, and perhaps extend the life of these assets is quite critical. The, the vision in terms of the fibre solution was always to be a scalable, much broader um, deployable solution. Now that was quite a, an ambitious goal. So we undertook a, a research project collaboratively with Park and RJ can, can step in in a moment and explain uh, what Park is all about um, as an organization, for, I guess, for those who do not know. Um, but at the same time, Park has come forward with some really key um, areas of advancement when it comes to development of fiber optic sensing solutions um, and some of the key critical hardware components, which are effectively one of the big cost prohibitive items for broader deployment. Uh, and the vision, as I said earlier, was always to steer away from the case by case deployment of sensing solutions as a reactive way to particular problems we've identified. Um, we've always looked for uh, a, a, an opportunity to, to deploy en masse and to effectively have a system that autonomously um, interprets the data from multiple bridge assets at the same time and can communicate back through, uh, pre, uh, so through processed um, bundles of information that come through as actionable insights. Uh, what that means, again, Arjo is, is far more equipped to uh, talk about uh, that uh, than I am. But the other element that Park really came to the uh, party with was in the area of advanced analytics and the ability to take these vast amounts of sensor data and make uh, meaning of them through uh, automated means rather than uh, a bespoke requirement to um, have teams of engineers analyze and interpret these data sets. So in terms of the, the breakdown of the hardware components, um, there'll be other uh, slides and opportunities to discuss this, uh, but also happy to, um, I guess, uh, take any comments or questions if, if you'd like as, as a moderator, John, in, in the meantime. Uh, the, the core in terms of the sensing element are fiber browse grading filters. Um, that's the top right-hand side of the diagram. Uh, the overall system architecture is that we have a, an array of sensors that are deployed on the bridge asset. They all feed into a... Uh, uh, park developed uh, multiplex high resolution fiber optic readout unit uh, with some edge processing. The uh, information is then sent to the cloud where we undertake a range of analytics uh, functions and therefore produce the various outputs. Next slide, please. To enable this um, opportunity in the initial stages of our works, uh, this now dates back to 2018 when the project actually kicked off. Uh, understanding that 
Vic track as in, in the Victorian government landscape is, is not effectively alone in, in the way that we manage assets and therefore our inherent problems and opportunities as a result are quite common. We have actually uh, rallied up a, a range of uh, institutions to join the governance uh, group for the project and therefore um, have brought together at the time prior to integrating into a, a Department of Transport. We had the earlier version of our Department of Transport to uh, Transport for Victoria, Vic, Vic Roads, uh, the Office of Projects Victoria with the Chief uh, Engineer for Victoria uh, overseeing our works as well, Public Transport Victoria, uh, Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions, and importantly, uh, key funding from the Department of Premier Cabinet and some uh, public sector innovation funding that uh, allowed us to kickstart the project. Uh, the project was split in two distinct phases, namely a proof of concept phase where we deployed an initial set of sensing equipment on one operational bridge. We then expanded to add another three bridges to the mix uh, and monitored those for some months prior to then reviewing our outputs um, with a, a clearly defined technical success criteria. And I pointed out the whole um, mass deployability of it um, that was always an important element to us and therefore we always had and maintained a commercial lens throughout the entire uh, project. Uh, next slide, please. At this stage, I'll probably pass on to RJ um, to, to describe uh, the uh, initial uh, bridge deployment and some of the key uh, outputs that we, that we gained from, uh, from those works. What I'd like to say uh, in relation to the prior slide is that was the Firebridge proof of concept trial project that ran till the end of December 2019. And upon uh, completion of a very successful trial, uh, our um, government stakeholders and, and partners on the project um, have collaboratively supported uh, our further initiative to then look at how to productize and take to market a, a scalable solution uh, through Firebridge. So we're at quite an exciting stage of the development of our works. Um, we're not quite there yet in terms of um, commencing activities uh, in, in this space as, as a productized offering, uh, but we're not far off either. So I guess the focus of today's talk would be to present some of the highlights of our trial works and some of the findings and key challenges as a result. So, RJ, over to you. Great, thanks, Dushan. So, as Dushan alluded, uh, our phase one, we uh, demonstrated the technology over a proof of concept project to begin with over a quarter segment of this operational highway bridge in suburban Melbourne. This is the Banksia Street Bridge, it's a Vic Roads asset. And working with uh, Vic Roads structural engineers and other key stakeholders, we identified a core set of uh, parameters that are of interest on this, at this bridge site for monitoring. Um, so uh, those are summarized here, uh, things like impact loads, vertical loads, and actual forces over key substructural elements uh, that covered the girders, the piers, uh, and uh, other critical structural elements. We uh, covered and uh, monitored all these parameters of interest using a network of fiber optic sensors. Uh, in total, we had 110 sensing points uh, using multiplex fiber optic uh, con sensing configurations that were installed over a week uh, in partnership with the local contractor and the University of Melbourne. That's our team there on the ground as we were installing it. And um, all of these uh, sensors uh, were particularly fiber brag grading sensors, as Dushan alluded. Uh, uh, this is a very quick introduction slide to, for those of you who may not be familiar with fiber brag gratings. Now, fiber optic sensors and fiber brag gratings have been around for a while uh, out there. Uh, and there've been a number of different configurations that people have explored for different types of fiber optic sensing solutions. Fiber brag gratings in particular is, uh, is an interesting type of those to give you some insights into how fiber optic sensors work. The way they're functionalized is you take a standard telecom fiber, uh, which is typically made of glass or plastic, and you change its refractive index over a small length, typically a few millimeters, but also uh, possible to extend that up to a few meters, especially for large area app mounting applications like in critical structures. 
but the basic functionality is to have a periodically modulated grating element which it makes uh, which is sensitive to a certain slice of the wavelength spectrum so then when i shine a white light source into this through using a laser or superluminescence diode that grating element reflects back a certain design wavelength determined by the spacing of the individual elements in that grating and um, then later if i introduce a stimulus over that grating in the form of a strain temperature or other parameter of interest depending on how i functionalize it that changes the spacing between the individual elements of this grating and therefore slightly different wavelength of light is reflected back i'm, I'm sorry this is rude but we are going to run out of time can we just sort of focus on the commercial aspects of this please um sure i thought we had a 20 minute slot we were targeting uh, to go over that as well in, in a couple of slides here. Yeah? We've got a half hour slot for three speakers. Okay, so I'll do a quick tour of the technical aspects and then we'll come back to the commercial aspects if you don't mind, John. I just give all, all the whole um, spectrum of the different technology elements and the commercial aspects that had to come to it to make this happen. Um, so um, the other huge advantage of fiber optic sensing is that you can multiplex this. So you can have many elements uh, at different wavelengths or using time multiplexing uh, strategies to have a large network of sensors on critical structures. And with our advances in optical readouts using photonic integrated circuits and other advances, we can mass produce these at uh, very affordable cost points for, for mass deployment of these uh, types of fiber optic sensors on critical structures. So uh, over uh, phase one, we worked with Vicroads and the other structural team members to define how we would monitor these structural elements using multiplex grading. So these are a couple of example conf sensing configurations. They were designed to monitor key structural elements, as I mentioned earlier, for impact loads and vertical loads, the girder bending impact and, and shear loads as, as key examples. And we had this network through a conduit connected to our uh, readout, and that was then connected to an industrial router and an edge device to have this uh, be uh, monitored through, from, uh, uh, from a central server uh, with analytics running on the edge. The cabinet where we housed our instrument, uh, our, our instruments had our optical readout, which is shown in this picture here. This is the first prototype of, of that readout concept, which was a multiplex readout specifically designed to monitor large network uh, fiber brag grading and other wavelength shift sensors. And this uh, has significantly pushed the envelope in terms of what's possible for fiber optic sensing by demonstrating 50 femtometers of resolution, which is a factor of 20 times better than the state of the art, uh, while also demonstrating significant multiplexing capabilities. And this, as I said earlier, can be mass produced using photonic integrated circuits at very affordable cost points for, uh, for broad deployment in structures and other critical assets. So um, this was then also combined with uh, advanced analytics to make sense of all that data in real time. In particular, we had to build reduced order structural models to, uh, to take all that data and translate it into parameters of interest to Vic Rose and the other structural uh, engineers. There's a detailed paper that we have published that I'm happy to share for those who may be interested in the uh, details of this. Uh, this was it's certainly a key piece of making this more scalable and not specific to a single structure or, uh, or asset. So with the success in phase two, we then went on uh, and, and started looking at scale up of this technology uh, to other types of structures and bridges, uh, some of which are shown here in this, uh, in this slide. Uh, with that, I'll hand the ball to uh, Dushan to uh, to speak to the scale-up and commercialization aspects, as he alluded to. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ajay. Um, as I said earlier, from the very onset, and I think this was one of the key differentiating factors, is that um, this project was run, A, as a research project, B, as uh, something that needed to meet commercial criteria for broader uh, deployment and scalability. And therefore, for us, the advancement of some of the key hardware uh, components, which at scale would yield uh, a huge point of difference compared to traditional systems uh, out there, particularly in the fiber optic space, given that they are um, quite cost prohibitive for broader deployments. Um, 
we have managed to overcome some of these obstacles through the advancements that were done uh, during the course of our works. Um, and I guess uh, more broadly is to also position it as an end-to-end -end solution. In other words, uh, no, it won't be able to do um, every uh, type of analytics uh, that, that you may be um, able to do separately through a very bespoke and detailed engineering assessment of an asset. However, um, if we look at this as a system that can be um, set up in a, almost like a set and forget way, where if it's cost effective enough to deploy on a broader asset base, particularly um, on our high risk, high value assets, it opens the door for uh, a real time monitoring system to be deployed, not just for structural health, but to also extract a range of operational insights. Uh, namely, we through the very high resolution um, results that come through the system, uh, we can detect uh, vehicle speed, uh, weight, uh, and various other parameters that are not related directly, or they are, but not directly of interest in terms of structural health as separately reportable metrics, but definitely are in the operational space. Therefore, there's a, a very strong opportunity, which we're also pursuing with our government uh, and transport partners here in extracting operational insights from this baseline technology. So that's another very significant use case that has come as almost a byproduct of our initial works. And secondly, and also importantly, is that this baseline technology, uh, given the fact that the analytics can be tweaked, the reduced order structural models can be adapted, is transferable to other structures. Um, other structures being other civil uh, assets, uh, more broadly, uh, things like um, wharf structures, um, and other, other civil uh, infrastructure come to mind where we're already working on pilots in deploying it, um, deploying Firebridge in that context. With broader deployments and operationalizing an entity that can tackle this uh, at scale, it brings down uh, costs through increase of efficiency. Um, it brings down costs through increases in volume of orders. And we really change the mindset in terms of the way that structural health monitoring could potentially be looked at rather than a reactive bespoke solution for a particular need. Uh, it can be an integral part of assets going forward. And therefore we shift our mindset into a very different realm of intelligent infrastructure. Now they all sound like high level fluffy words, but I guess this is one of the first stepping stones in the direction of uh, heading down that path. So uh, that's the vision in terms of details of the actual uh, commercial offering and structure. I'm actually not at liberty to discuss at this stage, given that we're in the final stages of uh, setting up an entity that takes this to market. But what we're looking at in terms of uh, a, a user-friendly uh, and, and deployable um, uh, output from the system would be uh, a simple web-based uh, solution that has everything from on the right-hand side a deep dive into structural health insights from a particular bridge, all the way right up to a, a portfolio level executive type um, snapshot of an entire asset base that is instrumented with uh, this type of sensing solution that can then uh, bring in various other data sets and inputs uh, and be overlaid and further enriched with uh, Firebridge data for a more contextualized um, a single point of uh, truth in terms of uh, the uh, structural health of our asset base, but also some key operational insights, um, whether we're, we're picking up any, any trends of degradation, how things correlate and, and uh, track with things like uh, capital and operating expenditure, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's the, the end view for the, for the product. Um, we've got a bit to go, but we're on a pretty good path to get there. So um, I pointed this out just before, um, we can quite easily and readily bring in and overlay additional elements such as live weather feeds, compliance and standards requirements, um, other types of sensing information, and CCTV, and importantly, any existing data. So it's, it's, it's leveraging all of the um, rich asset data that is currently um, within the existing systems uh, through um, specifically developed APIs, we can tune into those and further bring and contextualize all of that rich information together 
into a more holistic uh, monitoring system. So I'll stop there as I'm conscious of time. Um, I think in terms of summary and, and conclusions, we've I've sort of, I believe, uh, illustrated the, the um, end goal for our works. Uh, it's been an exciting two years of, of research and development. And the past year has been largely focused on how to operationalize this in a broader context. Um, and we're not far off from being able to publicly announce uh, something quite big in this space. So uh, I'll sort of pause and leave it at that. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the work of our uh, respective teams, namely at Park, um, at Big Track. Um, our, our key project sponsor was um, our chief executive and has really helped be the driving force behind a lot of our works. Uh, Park has had an extremely strong technical team that has helped support our works. It's the names that um, I've seen on lists of uh, this particular event. Uh, people who you may recognize as well from the University of Melbourne who are also core contributors to the early phase of our activities on the Proof of Concept Bridge. Uh, also, I noticed Colin Caprani. Uh, we've also met and worked together on bringing some of the data sets from the original Proof of Concept Bridge at Banksia Street. So uh, hello and, and thank you for the collaboration as well. Uh, thank you very much for a really interesting talk and cool project. I, I mean, it's a bunch of technical questions which you, you might well um, duck from. I, I guess if one of those pictures showed an unarmored and undressed cable or optic fiber. Uh, is that the, the sensing strategy? Are you you're avoiding um, the use of commercial or current commercial optic fiber based sensors by just doping um, raw cable or raw optic fiber as a substitute for sensors? Uh, um, to be clear, th there are coatings for protection. Um, but the key, the key is choosing the right coating to get the uh, structural responses of interest while also protecting the fiber. So, as you can imagine, we had to go through some iterations to figure out that right combination. Because mm -hmm. you overdo it, you will kill the structural response. You underdo it, you don't protect the fiber. So there, there is a balance between those two. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I know because we've bought several hundred of them, the uh, standard off-the-shelf optic fiber strain gauge, you know, fiber break gauge in, in a weld-on configuration costs over $400. Um, it, 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 we choose those because they're extremely robust um, and they'll cope with just about anything you can step on the cables. I, I guess that this solution isn't of that nature. But um, the, the to, to be sensitive to costs, you know, we we are not overdoing it with the coatings either. At the end of the day, there are some uh, interesting options in the telecom world because they had to go through the uh, iterations to figure out the right way to ruggedize those cables as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of useful lessons to be learned. At this point in the telecom world, you can get fiber, optical fiber for cents per kilometer. And really the cost uh, of, of uh, getting sensors, prototype sensors for, for some of these studies that you might do at smaller scale is dominated by the upfront engineering costs. At, uh, mm -hmm. As you go up in scale, uh, you know you, there there's opportunities to come closer to those uh, to those point cost points at which you get in the telecom world. Yeah, we again I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars on tactical grade optical fiber in order to do a testing job where it was going to get abused. Um, yeah, I, I understand that you can get. Um, non-robust uh, cables very cheaply um, and to get robust uh, equipment in this optical world does cost a lot. Um, how do you see this system with the vision that you have towards a, an asset monitoring system for assets that have had a hundred year design life? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and again, it goes back to my original point when responding to your question, right? There is that balance between the two, two ends of getting the response and protecting the fiber. The short summary, uh, again, is there's a lot of useful lessons to learn in the, from the telecom world as we have um, uh, from our collaborations and partnerships. Um, in the telecom world, they have had optical fiber running in some really uh, hostile environments for over 50 years and counting and the fibers are doing just fine. So mm -hmm. likewise, we expect to get a very long service life from the fibers. 
um, on the field. We don't anticipate that being a huge problem because you can get some uh, really great rugged materials to protect the fibers from all kinds of hostile elements. Mm. I guess, Dushan, thank you very much for the presentation and making the time to come here. And really good to have a project like that put in front of us um, and to really liven things up. Um, and impressive that you have got so many people who I really didn't think got on to you know, cough up money and contribute. Uh, I, I guess it, in you know, one of the things that interests a company like us is data sovereignty. Do you see yourself collaborating with others or do you see yourself as owning data and um, really you know, selling the whole service um, as an organisation or, or are you looking for collaborations in that space? Uh, I, I guess a bit of both. Look, at the end of the day, uh, from a, a data sovereignty perspective, there's sensitivities and, and I guess realities that we have to address in terms of existing customer requirements. Um, to leverage the data, the system is designed as well to leverage data from various uh, assets irrespective of uh, customers as well. So there are, there are very valuable insights to be taken uh, from similar uh, construction types, etc., uh, and therefore the system will look to, um, oh, sorry, the, the, the Highbridge entity would look to basically leverage insights from the entire uh, deployed um, asset base, um, irrespective of its location or custodian. Uh, but at the same time, that can be done in a manner that uh, doesn't disclose any particular information to anyone else around the actual um, data or, or any confidential information that the asset holder may hold uh, closely and dearly to their chest. When it comes to collaboration, uh, definitely opportunities uh, are there to be explored. Um, we're in the early stages of operationalizing um, quite an exciting new entity. Um, there are perhaps other minds that could contribute, other solutions out there, um, and no doubt uh, could result in, in a positive outcome for both sides. So I guess that's something to be explored um, in, in due course um, with with the relevant potential partners. Yeah. I think uh, the other comment I had was, and maybe Govinda's found the same thing, but in amongst the work that we're doing on other structures and bridges, I totally agree with you. It's the, there is a lot of indirect benefit um, where perhaps our first uh, mission was load quantification, or with quantification of um, fatigue environment, but then discovering relationships between speed, relationships between mass, uh, identifying overloaded vehicles and overloaded use of the bridge, um, identifying critical components of operation you become a hell of a lot more valuable and things that people can actually manage where deterioration is something that is, you can watch but you can't affect it a great deal. Um, Govinda, did you have any comment there? Look, I think it's a, it's a really interesting um, initiative and, um, and look, I would sort of like to learn, learn more about more about this in the future and, uh, and as I said in, in previous in the industry forums that we were starting from a very low base and and, and we just need uh, multiple solutions and and things into the market uh, just conscious of time john maybe sort of we'll get uh, Colin cool. and Paul sort of out of the way so that we okay. can, uh, well, I, I think that university partners on board as well in discussion Sure. Um, I, I'll, I'll, we'll move on, if that's okay. Um, Colin, I hope you're ready. I think one of the questions I had for Dushan is around value, and I think that we're just about to hear a bit from Colin on value. To, to put Colin in context, uh, Colin was a client of ours. We developed a structural health monitoring system for a building of his with close to 300 sensors. Um, yet to see any spectacular uh, outcomes from that, but fascinating project, and it was great to work with Colin and the team on, on that project. 